Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its history and what it's like to fight in-game as well. These videos, I like to use your suggestions down in the comment section below because I had my way for a few years where I picked whatever monster I wanted to draw, but we've got a really nice community growing here, so I like to use your suggestions. So if there is a monster that piques your interest, a monster that you really want to see me draw or just talk about the lore of or its history or even make into a creature for D&D, I homebrew a few of these things, make sure to leave it down in the comments section because I gather up every single one of your suggestions and add it to what I call my to draw list, a catalogue of hundreds of really, really fascinating monsters. And then once a month, I hand that to draw list over to my patrons over on Patreon, who no matter whether they back me at the price of a cup of tea every single month, all the way up to the very, very highest levels, all get an equal vote on which monsters from that list that they'd like to see me draw next. So if the idea of supporting the channel in a very, very personal way, helping me to make these videos and grow this channel sounds appealing to you, and so does the opportunity to have more control over the kind of content that you see from me, then I'll make sure to leave a link to my Patreon page down below in my description box. So you can follow that link and help support and vote every single month. But if that's not something you can do, just remember that I collect every single one of your suggestions anyway. So pop that in the comment section below. One such person, one such person who has left me a suggestion for a monster is TK Dean, who is the first person to suggest today's topic, which is Sphinxes. Sphinx-i? 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 Definitely not sphincters. The Sphinx. Plural. But although they weren't the first, I also need to make sure to mention Styrax, who has been so enthusiastic about Sphinxes and has been pushing for me to draw Sphinxes for so many videos over the years. It would be criminal not to give them a little shout out too. So hello Styrax, don't worry, I have heard you. You and TK Dean are both Sphinx enthusiasts. And as you've both been waiting for years, let's not delay any longer. Let's get started with today's video on Sphinxes. Now, Sphinxes are some of my absolute favorite mythological creatures, so I'm so, so excited to be able to draw how I would interpret them as an artist and also talk about their fascinating lore. In D&D, players may have encountered four different kinds of Sphinx over the years. The Andro Sphinx, the Cryo Sphinx, or Creo Sphinx perhaps, it's spelled with an I rather than a Y, the Gyno Sphinx, and the Hiraka Sphinx. Although, so far in 5th edition, only two of these aforementioned kinds are found in the Monster Manual, with the others undoubtedly being present in homebrew forms somewhere out there in the vaults of the internet. In 5th edition, both the Andro, meaning male, and Gyno, meaning female sphinxes, appear as separate creature types, and are depicted as 8 to 16 foot tall, winged lions adorned with gilded jewellery, grand, perhaps even regal pieces of armour. In their earliest incarnations in D&D, however, which I believe to be in 1989's Monstrous Compendium Volume 2, although if you know different, please make sure to let me know down in the comments, sphinxes appeared much more like their mythological counterparts as creatures with a human face, a lion's body, and a bird's wings. Because in their depictions in 5th edition, they actually just have lion faces, despite the text accompanying them, mentioning that they might have a humanoid face. I mentioned in my Manticore video that the move to make a sphinx look more lion-like may be to distinguish these two creatures between manticores and sphinxes, but personally, as a fan of the mythological inspiration for these creatures, I'll be definitely electing to go for a humanoid face. That's what immediately springs to my mind when I think of a sphinx. And that's what I'm really excited to draw. Sphinxes of all kinds can trace their origins to both Greek and Egyptian mythology. The most obvious example being the Great Sphinx of Giza, a colossal 240 foot long, 66 foot high limestone sculpture built to represent Pharaoh Khafre, sometime between 2558 and 2532 BCE. Although its purpose is largely lost to time, it was definitely designed with the intention to immortalize Khafre due to their efforts in constructing the Second Pyramid of Giza. In this massive sculpture, the Sphinx is depicted as a winged, lion-bodied man, but more often than not, Sphinxes are associated with having the face of a woman, and this is likely due to Greek myths which almost exclusively depicted sphinxes as female creatures in their art and legends. The other two types of sphinx that I mentioned before are actually present in real-world mythology as well, although they're much less common. The Creo Sphinx, 
which had the head of a ram, can be seen depicted guarding the Temple of Karnak, whose entrance is known as the Way of Rams, on the path to the entrance which is overseen by many such statuesque guardians. The Hieracus Sphinx often represents one of the many forms of Horus, the Elder, the God of Kingship and of the Sky, and this creature, just like his general representations, whether he has the body of a human or something else, has the head of a peregrine falcon. And ancient representations of this can be seen in the form of wall reliefs throughout the temple dedicated to Horus at Edfu on the west bank of the Nile River. The most common legends, or at least the most well-known legends of the Sphinx, lie not in Egypt, however, but in Greek mythology, in the tragic tale of Oedipus, a mythical king of Thebes. It's a long and calamitous story, whose full details I won't cover here, but in my opinion, it's the archetypal Greek tragedy, so it's definitely worth a read if you have a strong stomach. But the hero of the story encounters a sphinx guarding and terrorizing his would-be kingdom of Thebes, stood at its gates, surrounded by half-eaten corpses. The creature, and all subsequent sphinxes, enjoyed riddles and offered all travelers a brain teaser upon their encounter. If you were to solve this riddle, the Sphinx would permit you entry and leave the city in peace. But if you failed, the Sphinx would devour you on the spot. The riddle, which has since become probably the most famous riddle in the world, goes as follows. What walks on four feet in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three at night? The answer, believe it or not, is humans or man. The time of day refers to the stages of life. So as a baby, the morning, we crawl on all fours but we walk upright for the majority of our lives, but then in old age, we may require a walking stick, a third appendage, to support ourselves upright. Permitted entry for satisfying the riddle, Oedipus goes on to become the king of Thebes, for freeing them of that massive menace, and unfortunately goes on to marry his mom and gouge his own eyes out with a pin after he finds out. So, yay Oedipus? But in D&D, sphinxes are seen like divine beings, not unlike unicorns or perhaps more like the Kirin, but they're technically monstrosities with immense divine magic at their disposal, who pay homage to their ruthless inspiration by both being immensely strong and by honouring the agreement of sparing someone who can solve their riddles or pass their tests due to their lawful neutral alignment. To me, sphinxes embody what is great about D&D. In one capacity or another, they guard treasure. Traditionally, most commonly in the Andro Sphinx's case, this may be physical treasure of gold and jewels, perhaps magic items, which is referred to as belongings of the gods. Instruments of immense power held for eons in tombs or temples revering their creators or mostly, in the Gyno Sphinx's case, whose eyes pierce the veil of time and space, the treasure may be knowledge, truth of the past, or of futures yet to pass. They see beyond the realms of magic, and as such, Sphinxes of any kind are destined to draw adventurers to them, to quest for answers or epic treasure. They are the end of a quest, of a hero's journey through and through. Sphinxes, though, are conjured either by gods specifically to set trials for would-be travellers, or perhaps congeal and form from the ethereal magics of the realms where prayer and divine energies are strongest and task themselves with protecting a noteworthy prize. They'll then guard whatever they deem to be precious with some kind of riddle, puzzle, or challenge of their own creation, which can bend the laws of time and reality as they see fit. The example given in the Monster Manual is that, quote, a conversation with a sphinx that begins be between tumbled stone walls might suddenly shift to an alien locale, such as a life-size game board or a daunting cliff that must be climbed in a howling storm. So they pose fascinating mind games and puzzles, both physical and intellectual, for players to overcome. But furthermore, those who offer to participate in these trials of the Sphinx are bound just as the Sphinx is until death. No cheating or lying can occur during this pact. If players don't abide by the rules of a Sphinx's challenge or fail to complete it, the treasure or knowledge the Sphinx holds vanishes from reach of the player, such that only a wish spell could redeem it. The player may be teleported to another reality in which the treasure never existed at all, or their eyes may simply cloud over with blindness whenever they attempt to read such knowledge that they seek. Adherence to these puzzles is so absolute that in order to even locate 
the prize that they seek. Adventurers must sometimes even summon the Sphinx guarding it in order to initiate the trial so that this treasure will even exist on the same plane as them. But as well as losing the treasure, just like Oedipus's own riddle, when one fails a Sphinx's test, the result may be all manner of different punishments, including death at the hands of this creature which is more than capable of dishing out any kind of damage it needs to. When defending its lair, its life, or its treasure, a sphinx has lair actions that can alter time and space on initiative count 20. In my opinion, they may be the most attuned to time-based magic in terms of any creature in D&D, as they do this so effortlessly without really concentrating on it. They can force all creatures to re-roll initiative, deciding if they want to, to do the same thing, or maintain their position in the turn order if they think it's advantageous. It can alter the age of every creature in its lair by d20 years, either older or younger, which can only be fixed with a greater restoration spell. Otherwise, it can happily revert someone to a minimum of one year old, or age them into crumbling dust if they fail a constitution saving throw. They can alter time, such that the time outside the lair moves on without the party by 10 years, either forward or even backward. And this feat may be the reason that adventurers actually come to seek out the Sphinx in the first place, perhaps to return to an ancient moment or see what becomes of the future by literally visiting it. But with time passing without the adventurers, their friends and loved ones will age and potentially die, believing that the party died on their quests. I wonder if any ancient heroes in your campaigns have met with a sphinx and are believed to be dead, but are simply travelling instantaneously through time, yet to re-emerge. Make sure to let me know in the comments if you've ever used a Sphinx's time-traveling abilities in some mysterious way. I'd really love to hear your stories. Alternatively, using space instead of time, the Sphinx may shift those in the lair and itself to a whole other plane, with no more effort than lifting its pinky finger, bringing them to some sort of torturous dimension, something that a spellcaster would need to become quite practiced in magic in order to accomplish. The weakest of the two Sphinxes in the Monster Manual, unfortunately, at least in terms of challenge rating, is the Gyno Sphinx at challenge rating 11. But even then, it has 16d10 plus 48 HP and is resistant to non-magical attacks, as well as being immune to psychic damage and similar psychic effects, like fear or charming. No power can read a Sphinx's thoughts or its intentions if it doesn't wish to pass on that information voluntarily, and insight checks made against them are made with disadvantage. On its turn, it can make a claw multi-attack, eviscerating people for 2d8 plus 4 slashing damage twice, or casting one of its many spells, which it makes as a 9th level spellcaster. It has access to useful spells, like Legend Lore, Greater Invisibility, Remove Curse, Identify, Locate Object, and so on, but can also dispel magic and banish players if the need arises during combat. It has three legendary actions, which it can use to attack someone with a claw slash at the end of somebody else's turn. It can teleport itself up to 12 feet away, or it can cast one of its spells. The Andro Sphinx values a trial by combat and physical tasks much more than the Gyno Sphinx, apparently. And this is reflected in its challenge rating 17 and its higher strength stat at 22, compared to the Gyno Sphinx's still alarmingly high 18. They're immune rather than resistant to non-magical attacks, and in addition to all of the abilities and legendary actions that the Gyno Sphinx can perform, the Andro Sphinx has more offensive spells like Flame Strike, but also healing spells like Greater Restoration. It also has three very peculiar raw attacks, each slightly different, and each can only be used once a day and in a specific order. All of these roars are magical and affect every single person within 500 feet who hear them. The first roar frightens those who fail a wisdom saving throw for one minute. The second deafens and frightens those who fail the wisdom saving throw. And the third affects even those deafened by the second roar as an explosion of concussive sound deals 8d10 thunder damage and knocks prone all those that fail a constitution saving throw. So these creatures are incredibly powerful. And as such, I've decided that one of the things that I really wanted to do was make these guys into a warlock patron. They may not seem like, you know, some sort of challenge rating 24 mega demon, an arch fey, or some elder god, but their mastery of time and space, their peculiarities with riddling, the fact that they're not sylvan, celestial, demonic, they're just a monstrosity, it made me really curious and it made me think that they were the kind of creatures that would perhaps test someone by making them into a warlock, or perhaps use this person as an instrument of confusion. So as a result, on my website, which I'll leave a link to in my description box, 
I've made a Warlock Patron out of the Sphinx, which allows you to use many of its abilities and warp time and space as a kind of chronomantic Warlock, obsessed with leaving puzzles, creating traps, and orchestrating confusion. This may not be to everybody's taste, but I really enjoyed it and I hope one of my players uses it soon. I'm a big fan of time magic and a huge fan of Sphinxes. So I hope you enjoyed joining me today with this illustration. I had so much fun making this. If you enjoyed it as well, make sure to leave a little like down below, perhaps favorite this video, especially if you want to refer back to that Warlock patron and share it with the rest of your group. If you fear an imminent encounter with a Sphinx and need to brush up on your riddling skills, Everything you can do like that really, really helps this channel to grow and helps YouTube to know if I'm doing a good job. So all of your support really, really helps. Make sure to hit the little subscribe button if you've not already, because I release a video every single Monday. So I hope you'll join me next week. But until then, make sure not to aggravate a sphinx. Otherwise you might find yourself older than your own grandma or in a different dimension by the time you leave that conflict. And happy monster hunting.